topic which I think is, is becoming of increasing concern to people, and it is the issue of the reliability of memory and, and the ways in which memories can be affected by suggestions, particularly in the you know, psychotherapeutic setting. I think anybody watching this program has been seeing countless stories in the media now all over television, radio, newspapers, magazines because now we're being asked to examine a little more critically what we really know about memory, what we really know about suggestibility, and what we really know about the suggestibility of memory. Mm -hmm. And what we're learning is that memory is really quite a, a flexible thing. It's, it's, the mind does not work at all like a computer in the sense of, of reproducing memory inputs uh, with perfection. Correct. And we've had that analogy now for many years of the mind as a video camera and that all we have to do is stop and play back the images that have uh, been incorporated into our minds through years of experience and what we're finding out is that that's not an accurate representation at all. That in fact memory is very prone to many kinds of errors and errors through suggestion are just one type. Mm -hmm. Well maybe we can step back for a second and try and define what memory really is. It's if, if it's not like computer memory, it's not like video memory, well, how, how can we uh, portray it? Well, the phrase I think that best captures it is that memory is reconstructive, not reproductive. That in fact memory it comes from a variety of sources. And basically our memories can be very reliable, but they, it can also be very unreliable. So we're trying to understand more and more of what are all the different factors that influence the quality of memories. And now what we're finding out, it, is, it, it includes things like the person's mood, the person's expectations, the person's previous history with other kinds of uh, experiences similar to what's happening now, uh, the person's degree of emotional arousal and how pumped up they are, uh, what else is going on at the same time, background noise, and, and many other such mm -hmm. factors that, that determine the quality mm -hmm. and the quantity of memories that a person mm -hmm. establishes. And, and I suppose what was really relevant here isn't just memory, but it's the whole process of how do we forget as, as well, how do we retrieve? How do memories sometimes interfere with each other? Right. You know, we're looking at a very complex process. Memory has been studied now for almost 100 years, but it's really only been in the last 10 years or so that any really good quality studies have been done to address the questions of how do we remember, how do we forget, and much of that research has taken place in neuropsychology and it really has not yet filtered into the world of clinical psychology which is really the world that I operate in because clearly what happens in, in my professional practice and the professional practices of most therapists people will come in sit down and they will say some variation of this happened to me mm -hmm. when I was five or this happened to me when I was ten. Mm -hmm. Well Sigmund Freud in really setting up the, the, the first theoretical framework for, for what has become psychotherapy uh, suggested that there were many unconscious factors that could affect memory. That's true and some of what Freud had to say has been borne out over the years through research and through clinical experience and some of what Freud had to say about it is terribly dated and is in many ways obsolete. Mm -hmm. So f the, the standard that Freud set is not really the one that I would encourage people to use now as a current model of understanding. Freud originally, uh, let's, with regard to childhood r r reports of actually adults that they had uh, uh, sexual uh, memories from their childhood. He discounted these as fantasies. Right. And that has led to many problems. You know, there, there are a couple of issues in that particular question that you're asking. And one is, why don't people remember much from their childhood in general? Mm -hmm. And the so-called uh, uh, childhood amnesia that was assumed to be psychologically motivated, that there must have been issues and conflicts going on in childhood that somebody would repress or suppress, keep out of their awareness. And then the other issue is when people come in and report episodes of incest, episodes of sexual abuse from childhood, are they real or are they fantasy? Now the fact that Freud deemed them largely fantasy has had a very lasting impact that has been very detrimental to the field because what we now have come to realize, of course, is that not only does incest happen, but it happens far more frequently than we ever imagined. 
but for the first three quarters of this century, people assumed it wasn't happening, that, these were, th that when someone came in and said, this happened to me, they were very likely to be ignored. Mm -hmm. and, and their allegations dismissed as a product mm -hmm. of sheer fantasy. And, and I suppose it's fair to say for the record that the real challenge to Freudian thinking on this issue came from uh, therapists who had a feminist orientation and, and felt that he was discounting the reports uh, of women. I think that's true. I think that uh, feminism has played a huge role in starting to redefine our understandings of what happens in families, what happens in healthy families versus unhealthy families, and what sexuality ultimately is about and redefines our understandings of uh, parent-child relationships in which there are elements of sexuality and uh, I think we're deeply indebted to them in that regard. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I suppose we have the classical Freudian view that, that reports of uh, childhood sexual uh, trauma are almost certainly fantasy, and on the other hand, there, there's also a point of view that would suggest that these reports are almost certainly accurate memories. You're right about that, and, and that concerns me a lot because what it represents that you've just captured so well is the extreme polarity in the field. You have at one end of the spectrum all the individuals who say you have to believe every report no matter how absurd or no matter how questionable the circumstances were in which the report was made, and then you have other individuals who uh, question everything, mm -hmm. who, who believe nothing, who dismiss it right away. And of course, the, the, the extremes never serve an understanding of reality very well. And so really what I've been trying to do in the work that I've been doing is try and help people understand both sides of it, mm -hmm. which is that abuse happens with far, far too great a frequency. And at the same time, it's also true that under certain conditions there are false allegations that come about. And it, it seems to me that what we really have to do is create an atmosphere where it, people can be believed when they come forth with these reports and that we make sure at the same time that no one is creating these kinds of memories unintentionally. Mm -hmm.